Okay, good day everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar presentation. My name is John Clements. I am with the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends throughout the cybersecurity and information systems science and technology community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do this by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. We provide research and analysis services and help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity and information systems science and technology. Uh, before we begin, I'll note a couple of administrative items. Uh, first, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csioc.org slash webinar and find today's webinar. When you click on it, at the bottom of the announcement, it will say view presentation slides here and you can download them from there. Second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of your webinar screen. You can chat with each other and I will be monitoring the chat as well. However, if you would like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. It is the icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the emoji. At the end of the presentation, I will go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. If you have a technical information during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Check back on the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the Go to Webinar button will take you to the YouTube link. And to, without further ado, today's webinar will be the improvement of U.S. Air Force Cyber Defense, presented by Colonel Anthony Franks. Colonel Franks, uh, oops, excuse me here. Sorry about that. Colonel Colonel Anthony Franks is the Vice Commander of the 94th Airlift Wing, Dobbins Air Reserve Base, Georgia. He received his U.S. Air Force Commission and undergraduate pilot training from the U.S. Air Force Academy. After serving more than eight years on active duty, he joined the U.S. Air Force Reserve. A command pilot with more than 4,000 military flying hours and six different aircraft, he has flown combat missions in nearly every major worldwide contingency during the past 19 years. He has served in a variety of positions and assignments throughout his military career, working in Air Combat Command, Air Force Special Operations Command, Air Mobility Command, Air Education and Training Command, and Joint Special Operations Command. Colonel Franks is also a United Airlines First Officer rated in the Boeing 757 and 767. And with uh, with that, sir, I will turn it over to you for the presentation. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, I'm gonna try to share my video so you can see my uh, beautiful face. Uh, I'm actually in Atlanta, Georgia right now uh, doing doing uh, my, uh, my drill up here. Uh, so I, I wanted to quickly just kind of Go over uh, just what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the how do we improve, uh, you know, Air Force cyber defense? But particularly, what I'm going to spend time on is a concept that the Air Force has been doing for the last uh, now going on seven years, which is the creation of a mission defense team, and that came from the uh, the Cyber Squadron Initiative, trying to transform pieces of communication squadrons in the Air Force to cyber operations squadrons at a, at a wing level. So I'm gonna get into that here in, in a minute. Um, who am I? Legacy pilot, he, he kind of talked about that. Uh, I was teaching uh, on on uh, on active orders on the military for about four years uh, at a place called the Air Force Cyber College, which is a Maxwell uh, Air Force Base in Alabama. It's uh, it's part of the Air War College. And, and then the last year I transitioned over to become a, a civilian professor. Uh, what I was doing was I was teaching um, Air Force mission defense teams that I was telling you about a, a second ago. Also, uh, Cyber Command's uh, cyber protection teams, uh, including Army, Air Force, uh, Marine, Navy. Uh, and, and I was also doing uh, teaching cyber fundamentals at a classified level 
uh, to people who are not in the cyber career field, uh, intelligence officers, uh, tactical air control parties, battlefield air on the ground, uh, air crew. And so I actually what, left my pilot duties uh, for the Air Force and I converted over to be a 17 Delta in cyber operations uh, for the Air Force uh, down at Air Force Special Operations Command inside of the A6. Uh, the job that I was doing was standing up uh, these these cyber defense teams at a wing level, standing them up for, for AFSOC, as well as we created a cyber defense correlation cell at the major command level overlooking all of these wings and numbered air forces we were in charge of all of these mission defense teams trying to help correlate them and coordinate for them uh, to get uh, help above the wing level, uh, whether it's Cyber Command, whether it's uh, uh, Air Force and the, the 16th Air Force, which is our uh, air, our cyber and intelligence communities combined. Uh, I am currently sitting in Atlanta doing the, the, the Vice Wing Commander job. Uh, and right now I just took over uh, as a professor down at Air University's Blue Horizons program. Uh, it's an entrepreneurship innovation program that we select uh, Air Command uh, staff as well as uh, Air War College students and, and put them in that. Okay, rules of engagement. Um, the uh, this briefing is 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 mine. Uh, this is not the Air Force's opinion. Uh, this is not uh, Department of Defense. This is this is Tony Franks's opinion of the stuff that I saw over the last six years. Uh, and so I, I'm going to speak freely. Uh, and please uh, don't hold any of my comments against anyone else. These are all for me. Uh, I'd appreciate if if uh, you have questions, attack the arguments that I'm making, um, and, and, and we can stick to there. Okay, so where, where are we at for the Air Force, uh, particularly for uh, the, the Cyber Squadron Initiative? Uh, it started in 2016, and what they did was, um, uh, somebody said their sounds out. Hopefully I'm still going through. So anyway, um, Cyber Squadron Initiative uh, to act in 2016 created these local wing level uh, at bases, a, a, a portion of a small cyber defense team called a mission defense team that would help out a wing commander to protect um, assets. And, and I'll talk about those things here in a minute. Uh, it, it was it was and also another thing that happened in 2016 was the National Defense Authorization Act uh, created a thing called the 1647 uh Write up, which basically told DOD that they had to look at cyber vulnerabilities, particularly for all of their major weapon systems, thinking airplanes, missiles, those kind of things. So we stood up a cyber resiliency office for weapon systems in that year. Uh, we also had the operational test evaluation community doing these assessments. We had cyber protection teams, and then we started having these mi new mission defense teams start looking at weapon systems. Uh, a year later, they also started looking at uh, infrastructure, base support, those kind of things. Um, in 2018, Air Force Cyber left the, the at the time Air Force Space and went over to Air Combat Command, and it, that's where it resides right now. We also stood up a thing called Enterprise IT or Information Technology as a Service, trying to see how many military bodies we could help if we put. IT at a local level, thinking like, you know, your computer, your telephones, those kind of things. If we can free up the military, maybe we could help some more space in these local defense teams that would need to be military. Uh, a year later, uh, the 24th Air Force, which was cyber, and the 25th Air Force, which is intel and weather and some of those functions, put together those 10 wings underneath the 16th Air Force and became a three-star command. This year, uh, earlier this year, there were over 84 mission defense teams across the different bases in, in areas across uh, the world. This FY coming up starting next month, what's going to happen is, is that only about 19 of those teams are going to be fully funded. And of those fully funded, about 10 are going to have the manpower, the, 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 the training, the billets, the weapon systems to do that. The other nine are going to get a piece of that. So they're only supporting 19 teams, kind of. And so the challenge is going to be is that um, uh, hopefully hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Can I get a thumbs up if somebody can hear me? I hopefully I'm not just talking to myself. Okay, cool. Good. All right. Uh, and then who knows what's going to happen the next year. Okay, awesome. That's a lot of thumbs ups. Thank you so much. Uh, so the idea of, of integrated cyber defense for the Air Force really relies on, on three core pieces of this triangle on the, on the right side, okay? There's proactive, or we'll call active defense. Those are people with a weapon system that has computers and sensors plugged into some 
network, weapon system, infrastructure, and they're actively looking for vulnerabilities. They're actually looking for potentially enemies. They're actively looking for, for what the problems are, and they're, and they're your, your, your active defenders looking at these things. There's also another piece called resiliency, which is how do we improve or make better the technology or the people or the processes of how this works? So if you find these assessments they were doing a few years ago and looking at these cyber vulnerabilities, who's making our systems, whether they're a computer in the F-16 or a satellite uh, board that has cyber going in and out of it, how, how do we improve that? And then the last piece is our automated or semi-automated defenses. We call that defense in depth. You know, your, your antivirus, your firewalls, your whitelists, your blacklists, your, your patching, all of those things that are more, more or less automated or, or semi-automated doing those things. And that's the, the bulk of the work. The bulk of the work for cyber defense in the Air Force is really that layered defense at, at an automated, semi-automated defense level. The proactive or active defense, people doing stuff, they're not always doing things every single time to every weapon system. We don't have a mission defense team plugged into the F-22 fighter aircraft constantly looking at this stuff. They might be looking at the computers to touch it in and out uh, periodically, uh, and we'll get into that here in a minute. Okay, but this is kind of the idea of these three areas, and that's what I'm going to kind of kind of talk about a little bit, poke, poke a little bit of, of this uh, th this bear, is because these three areas, when we created these mission defense teams, they're not really getting after it, and I'll, I'll explain that here in a minute. Uh, the way I view cyber for the Air Force, I look at three kind of bins, big bins, and at different levels of mission and that kind of stuff. But the three big bins are your traditional information technology, uh, your computers, your routers, your printers, that kind of stuff. On the right side is, is your weapon systems, uh, a software-defined radio that goes into an F-35 that works with data links in, 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 uh, on the battlefield, uh, satellite overhead giving precision navigation and, and timing, uh, and being able to communicate that uh, to the people on the ground, getting target coordinates, all these cyber data links in, in computers and networks happening to be able to deliver effects on the battlefield. And then finally, we have operational technology in the middle of your base infrastructure, of your water treatments, your, your fuel, your uh, power supplies, those kind of things. Historically, the communication squadron was only looking at the information technology, the computers, and making sure that network was working. The civil engineers were looking at the operational technology, and then finally, your maintenance squadron were looking at the computers that were plugging uh, into the aircraft or the computers actually in the aircraft. And so what we're trying to do was have one kind of team, a mission defense team, be able to help out all of these areas and actually provide uh, these three areas of improvements to defense in depth, improvements of resilience of weapon systems, uh, having an active defender actually looking at what the information is coming out of an aircraft or the vulnerabilities of an operational technology and to make, to, and make improvements, okay? So I'm kind of going to tear each one of these apart and talk about what was happening. Active defense, the very top layer, what happened was, I think mistake number one was we gave this to uh, the wing commanders of the bases, the base commanders. And it's not that the base commander has a bad idea. It's the, what we never told them what a mission defense team was. There's no formal education. There is a wing commander course. It's literally down here at, at Maxwell Air Force Base. And we have wing commanders come through multiple times in a year and they have uh, three weeks and they, they talk everything from law, law and, and, and emergency management and, and all kinds of things. We don't really describe to them cyber defense, how to report things, uh, what happens, you've been intrusion cyber on your base. Those kind of conversations are not taking place. I've talked to multiple wing commanders who didn't even know they had a mission defense team on their base. So if they don't know they're there, they're probably not using this asset effectively. And that's what we're seeing is the assets not being not being uh, effectively used. For the mission defense team side, the actual team itself, well, we put them in the in the mission support group. That's where the comm squadron's at. And we kept them in the comm squadron. So what's happening is you have additional duties, people are 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 doing trouble tickets, people are still doing network jobs and they're being pulled apart in different directions. Uh, and we don't give them a, a operational education on how Air Force operations work, uh, on, on command and control, on uh, off offensive uh, weaponeering, on uh, how we move mobility uh, around the world. Those are, those, are, those are the missions we do in the Air Force 
the technology, the, 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 the computers and those kind of things, the support mechanisms are all there to support those missions. We never really explain those missions uh, to this mission defense team. So it's almost like they have to kind of figure out what at their base, what the base does, uh, and then in trying to make up good ideas. Uh, we had no expectations or timelines of when they're going to be initially or finally operationally capable. There was just, you're now a, a mission defense team on the space, and what training can I help you out with? They gave them a little bit of training, basically about seven weeks. They do a, about a six-week course at Little Rock to learn the weapon system, and a one-week course at Maxwell to talk about uh, a little bit of understanding vulnerabilities and how to get after vulnerabilities. But it's not a formal training unit. It's not you go to this base for six months, nine months, a year, and become a formal training unit. And I look at communicators as maintainers of the network. And they're not quite the operators because the operators, like flying airplanes, the operators in, in cyber are the are the cyber protection teams. Those are the, the national mission teams. Those are people who are doing offensive and defensive cyber operations, not the maintenance of the network and, and making sure the network works, which is a very, very important job. That's why the majority of your comm squadron is not going to become mission defense team, only a small portion of them. But for those operators, those mission defense teams, we're not giving them formal, formal education. We're only, we never funded it. We never billeted it. That never happened until literally next month is be the first month. And it's been going on since 2016. So for over six years, we've been doing this without funding and in, 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 in giving them proper billets. There is some money for some training, but and, and it's from weapon systems, but they, they was not fully funded like you would think about an operational unit flying airplanes or, or driving tractor trailers, whatever you're doing. Uh, and so what's happened is with both the wing commanders not knowing things and being educated and the mission defense teams, we don't have a good return on investment. Of about the 84 teams, I could name eight teams right now that are giving any kind of return on investment that's actually worthy praise that is is that that the Air Force would want to know about. The other teams, they're stuck in training. They're, 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 they're not getting support they needed from, from leadership. Um, they're still trying to figure out what 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 uh, what the weapon systems need to be looking at and the wing commander investment. So they're not getting the support they need. And so, but the other teams and the other challenges is that as you as you PCS, as you leave your base and go to another base, you may not be going to a a mission defense team uh, unit because there's only 84 there. So you might be going to a communication squadron. So the that maybe that three years that you were assigned there, all the learning that you that you got out of being on this team are not going to be used on another place. And so we're seeing these eight, kind of eight, ten teams rotate around. So one team at Spangdong Air Base in Germany was amazing for about two years. A big PCI cycle comes through uh, for the next couple of years, and all of a sudden, nobody's left that actually knows knows uh, what they're doing. They didn't get any lessons learned. Okay, so I can poke holes all day long, but what's my idea of how to improve it? Well, these are just Tony's ideas, but the secret sauce that I found over the six years of, of teaching this and, and going around different bases around the world was, one, that you had to have leadership on it. You had to have wing commander, group commander, squadron commanders completely bought in on this idea. If not, then stop what you're doing because it was a wasted effort. This kind of effort is a is a is got to be from the Air Force level, which the chief of staff signed, the Cyber Squadron Initiative, he actually signed that, um, I believe it was two years ago, and the wing commanders have to understand what's going on there and, and have to be uh, have to be uh, prodded a little bit, but also they have to believe that this mission is worthwhile. And then the second secret sauce that I found um, is that when I came to, to my base, the, the mission of fencing was trying to do a lot of great things, but they were kind of in their own silos. They were kind of coming up with ideas on their own. And so what I had them do was I said, I need to have other pieces, other pieces from other, other units, these people. I need to put these pieces in place. So I started combining the operations, the, the, the flying community. I put the maintenance community in there. They were looking at through the, um, the computers on the planes and, and, and the avionics and those kind of things that support it. And then intelligence, making sure that they they knew what vulnerabilities were out there. They could look at those classified stuff and find out what's being done out there and what's the threat. And when I put all those pieces together, I started getting a return on investment. And those are kind of the two secret sauces that I found. Uh, another couple of options for you of, of courses of action or COAs is either one, my opinion, if you're not going to 
uh, hold them accountable and you're not going to, uh, you know, give education to wing commanders, then you're going to need to pull the, this, this, this capability back and hold it at the air combat command level. Hold it at a major command level and then put accountability and you have to press those teams and you hold those teams accountable, not the wing commander. Because he's not going to hold them accountable if, if he doesn't know that he even has them. And then you put a timeline to it. You say you have two years to become fully operational and I'll need a return on investment. I need to see vulnerability assessments. I need to see how you're building resiliency or how you're requesting improvements through these program management offices or, 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 or these kind of people who run the actual programs to the weapon systems. Uh, I think, or two, I think, which, which is harder, I guess, but it's, it's, it's harder and take a little longer, but I think it's cheaper in the long run, which is you got to educate, integrate, operate. You got to educate the, the, the commanders. And that's not the job of the mission defense team that they spend all this time in the wing commander's office. It's got to be formal education. The wing commanders get when they're coming through wing commanders courses to be educated on what they're doing. You have to be able to educate the mission defense teams with air force missions. I think you create a formal training unit or at the very least that they become mission qualified when they go to their wing and learn that their wing is, is, is a missile base and they're going to learn all the ins and outs of the, of the missile systems. And then we sign them off and say, you're good to go. Educate that. Integrate the mission defense teams on real world deployments, exercises, all these kind of things. I don't see a lot of that. Um, very, very few wings actually exercise these, these members or deploy or, or deploy them. We got to integrate this program management offices um, or, or, or the special program offices with the authorities to be able to give them the ability to actually integrate that weapon system that they've been trained to, to be able to do passive defense on those, on those special networks. And I know that that's going to be a huge rub, and I'm not saying that this is going to be easy, but there's been multiple general officers way higher ranked than me that have had multiple memos go out and none of them have been answered because of lots of reasons. Uh, uh, most of it has to do with you. These are contracts. You, what happens if you break something? There's, there's a lot of the turning reasons or, or a lot of, a lot of reasons why, but my argument is, is that if you're not going to be able to do those kind of things, then don't have them do active defense. Then at that point. Uh, the last thing is you got to operationalize the teams. Um, they have to be able to talk to the wing commander, get know kind of what the risks are with these vulnerabilities. The wing commander then has to prioritize these things. There's only one kind of way that that you can implement these things a few at a time and then figure out the, the courses of action you want to do, coordinate those things, and then go do that. Uh, I don't see a lot of that happening. I don't see a lot of that integration between the wing commander having to prioritize rack and stack the missions of what or the systems they want to look at those kind of things. Okay, so that's that's kind of that's kind of one area. Um, second area, resiliency. How do you how do you make it better? I, I think there's a misunderstanding of how people view risk. Okay, I view risk as that there is a vulnerability that you own, whether you know it or not. There's is a vulnerability inside your system, inside your mission, inside you. And there's a threat, outside threat, whether that's lightning or a, a insider threat, China, whatever. There's a threat that acts upon that vulnerability. And then eventually, what's the likelihood of that threat doing it? And then finally, what is the consequence if this threat actually materializes that vulnerability and acts upon it and exposes that? There's, there's, there's got to be a consequence for that, you know, whether that's human life, breaking the system, stopping the mission from happening, degradation. Lots of levels of what that consequence is. I think risk assessments have to involve the entire system of systems. What I see a lot of times is people start talking about things like servers. I'll just use that as, a, as an easy, easy, easy reason. People say a, com a comm squadron has a server. They have a backup server. And I'll hear things like, well, the server is getting old. We need to replace the server. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. But let me ask a better question. What does the server actually need to operate? And when I start looking at these things, there, there's things like I, I have to have usually physical security, a good area to lock this thing in. Uh, I have to have cybersecurity. I have to have air conditioning. I have to have power. But usually there's some kind of sprinkler system or some kind of safety features involved. So it's not just the server itself. There's a bunch of things that it needs. So if I was going to update a five-year-old server or you gave me the money and says, well, you can do that, 
or you can upgrade your 25 year old air conditioning. I know what my answer is going to be, because if you don't have air conditioning in that thing, and that thing breaks all the time, you're turning that server off yourself or it's going to get really, really hot and not be able to work. So it's a system of systems. You have to understand all those and weapon systems are the same way. Uh, it's not just the F-22, it's the computers and the mission plannings and the, and the maintenance people. It, it, it's the updates to these weapon systems. Uh, it, it's the data links. It's, it, it's a system of systems. It's not just the airplane. There's multiple things happening here. Um, and I think that sometimes vulnerabilities aren't always acted upon. I think sometimes I see these cyber assessments and I think, well, what's the actual likelihood that's going to happen? Yes, it might be, it could be a complete mission failure, but if we actually did it, it, an assessment to go, is this likely that this enemy even knows this is there? Or, or, or is it going to be like seven concentric miracles to get to this thing? And you're like, oh, well, if I had access to this thing 24 seven and spent time and had an incredible knowledge of this weapon system, that I could do these 15 things. And I say, okay. Where's my intelligence that says the threat can actually do this, has a capability? I'm not saying they don't. What I'm saying is where is that intel assessment of that vulnerability? Because at the end of the day, that as a commander makes me think about prioritization, decision making, really understanding the true risk. Uh, and then the last thing is, is that, man, we. The program management offices have have have, have done such a great job uh, holding their FITOs in place. And if you're a PMO, I'm not trying to rip you apart, but you have a great FITOM. You have those contracts. The contractors are are, are, are are doing what they're supposed to do, right? Is is make the weapon system work and make sure that nobody, uh, if you want to, if you want me to update something, then I want you to pay me. Uh, and that's just how, how the nature of the beast is. But without getting authorities to be able to, to take the risk and, and plug in these, these uh, weapon systems or to understand the weapon systems even simpler, then what's happening is, is that the chief of staff of the Air Force has an action or a B or, for, or a bureaucracy. And that's what we're dealing with at this point is the bureaucracy of, well, it's mine. It's my fight. So I can't let you have it. I'm not willing to break any eggs. I'm not willing to think differently. Uh, and, and so my, my question then would be, well, is it riskier to do that and let them plug in? Or is it riskier to not do anything and let China and Russia figure things out? I, I, my opinion at this point is I think we're at, at a point where I think I'm willing to break some eggs and take the risk because I, I got to know what I, what, what, and, and I, and I know I don't know a lot about these weapon systems from a cyber capacity. Let's, let's start ripping this thing apart and understand it better. And, and if we got to change stuff, okay, we got to change stuff. And yeah, maybe I have to pay the contractor or whatever, but at that point, at least I can know to a commander point of view, what the true risk is of flying this asset in combat uh, from a cyber standpoint. Because I have looked at multiple classified documents and I have flown multiple airplanes in my career and they all had cyber vulnerabilities that I wish I would have known about. And that, that study wasn't done until years later. Okay, so what can we do? Um, okay, one, I think understanding that mission, that mission is always first and then understanding that the mission has to get done and, and then what's the risk to the mission. I think we have to understand the mission pathway. How do I get the mission accomplished? OK, and if it is a system of systems, then we have to be able to take different people who own pieces of this system. Right. The the communicator, the 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 electrician, the the, the CE squadron, the, the 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 maintenance. We have to be able to take those people and put them together to one, start looking at the different risks of the areas that they own. OK, I think, two, I think we have to know our enemy. OK, I think you have to know yourself. And I think you have to know your enemy. And I don't think we do a great job of the reason why I say that is I am not worried. China is doing a great job for intellectual property theft. They have not devoted their cyber teams to do a bunch of disruption and killing people on the battlefield. It's more of stealing the way to the top. Russia is completely different. It's all about disruption. It's all about the beginning of the great bareback. And I wouldn't draw a lot of conclusions, especially on cyber capabilities that Russia has, based on Ukraine. That's a different story about poor planning and trading vodka for fuel and some other things going on there and the entire world coming against them, not just uh, the, 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 the country of Ukraine. So that's for a different topic we can have later. But I think you have to know your enemy and know their capabilities and what, what you're vulnerable to on that side. Also, you have to know your systems. You have to understand the risk. And I've talked about already kind of the, you know, 
it, what's the best option here? If, if you have a system of systems, what is the most vulnerable to me? What's the outdated thing? I would rather you patch the industrial control system that does the HVAC than adding the, the patch Tuesday to the computer system, everything. Do I want you to do that? Yes. But if I had to prioritize, if you say you have a choice between A or B, I know what I would choose. Uh, I think that a lot of people, especially in different offices, think that they own risk. And I'll be honest, leaders and commanders are the ones that own the risk. They're putting people's lives in harm's way in, in, the, in those weapon systems. Everybody else are informers and advisors of risk. Okay. And so that means to me is that I, as a support person, am feeding my boss information for them to be able to consume, prioritize, and then make decisions on. Okay. And I think we have to be able to walk, be able to put people in the right places. And, and the people who are yelling the most at the tables that I see are the people that are, are really thinking that they own something that they don't. It's, it's the person that's getting paid uh, the big bucks, the CEO that really at the end of the day owns a risk. Other people are informing him or her about that. Um, and that means that there's, there's a trade space to not only understand risk, but also where you can take risk and where to improve things. And that is a leadership decision, but it's also leaders have to make risk-informed, intelligent decisions. And if they don't have that information, then how are they ever going to make good decisions? And so, and I think that part of that has to do with understanding the mission, understanding the systems, the things I've talked about. And then in the last area, and I, I don't want to beat it up too much, but in the acquisitions and weapons system authorities, uh, it, being able to, one, in those offices, being able to have integrated teams, uh, uh, including operators, including people who fly airplanes, shoot missiles, uh, run satellites. I think there has to be representatives there, not just good engineers, good acquisitions, good contracting officers. I think those people are obviously necessary, obviously super important. But I think we have to integrate a few other things in there, including like intelligence and those kind of things uh, to understand at the ground level what how these things are being utilized. Um, and then then we can, I think, understand better about the risk and appropriately, I think, appropriately delegate or or assign the right risk at the right levels. Is that thing at that point? I think you can pivot faster than an enemy if you know the information and you're willing to take a little bit of that. Hey, if I don't do this, it's more risky than if I do do something. Um, so, okay. Uh, last topic, um, defense in depth. There's automated defenses. I'll be quick on this one. Uh, one, I don't think technology is, is the answer. Um, I hear all the time about zero trust. I was out at a, um, at, uh, Defidic, the Department of Air Force IT and Cyber Conference, uh, two weeks ago. And man, everybody's talking about zero trust this, zero trust that. Zero trust has to be understood. You have to understand the system. It is not just plug in zero trust key, turn knob, get, get banana, and, and that's the answer. You have, still have to have people to understand a lot more detail of, of the systems. And what we're trying to do is, especially for the Air Force, is let's go chase that technology. Blockchain was a perfect example. I heard a general officer one time when blockchain started becoming popular, Bitcoin and all that stuff, and he's like, let's blockchain the Air Force. Well, here's the thing. Uh, if, if you have the blockchain works, and some of you probably know way better than me, but there is there is a time piece to this and, and, of how the, the ledgers and who's integrated and blah, blah, blah. And so if I blockchain, I can, blockchain chaining acquisitions, blockchaining uh, contracting, blockchaining, um, you know, information, it, not a bad thing. It's a great thing. But I don't want to blockchain the nuclear command control industry. I don't want a blockchain personnel rescue when I need a, when I have a down pilot and I have to have a vote on this. No, like launch the force, go get them. Hey, turn the key. Might, we have, might have to, you know, scare Russia with a nuclear crisis. But my point is not everything has to be this way. Like not one piece of technology is the sole answer. And we're chasing a lot of these, these flavors of the day. Uh, we can't divest it all. We can't give it all to contractors. And enterprise IT as a service was a perfect example at, down, down at Air Force Special Operations I had two of my uh, bases in the U.S. had had, block, uh, had um, enterprise IT as a service. And I tell you, they can't cover it all. They can't cover all the classifications. They can't cover all the bases. It's too darn expensive. They just can't do it all. So we can't divest of all this defense in depth. I talked about kind of knowing your enemy. Another thing is, is that AI machine learning is not going to save the day. 
Okay, one is it's not it's not as advanced, and, and there's there's silos of excellence places, but we're not there yet. So, in other words, um, it, that can't be the savior right now. And another thing is is that is that there's a thing of a heuristics which the enemy when it starts tapping into networks, uh, especially peer adversaries, it's not like they just barrage it and slam it with a hammer. They're kind of pinging and testing and kind of testing what what is the the avenue how much is your when is your 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 system going to kick off when is when is that when is that that proxy when is that firewall when is when is that that antivirus going to kick in they they're, they're pretty clever on on figuring out how, how to kind of hide sometimes in the white noise and, and pick and prod um and so not always is the defense in depth is going to be the perfect answer i do think the automated signal on defense is at a great 85 percent solution no question and i do think there is there is a play there for improving in resiliency and also the active defense. That's why it's not just defense in depth is, is the piece of the triangle. It is the biggest part on the bottom, but there's other pieces to it that need to maybe come up to a better, uh, more integrated uh, defense strategy. Uh, last thing is is that you know better yet than knowing knowing your enemy is knowing your troops. Um, man, I tell you, people, I get we have to, we talk about insider threats to a blue in the face, but I'll be honest with you. A negligent user is way more threatening to the network than an insider threat ever will be. Because what's terrible is they're ignorant, they don't know what they're doing, and they're doing stupid stuff, and they're just constantly doing it because they don't know any better. In Cybersecurity Awareness Challenge, Jeff and Tina every year telling me to take the cat card out and, and make a better password is not the only piece to, to cybersecurity. That's what majority of people are getting out of it. And so compliance, as good as compliance is, there's still going to be people out there that are, that are doing silly stuff. we got to be able to educate them on a more advanced way of understanding simple things that they can do to improve the overarching network security. And they're going to be the biggest limp back. The human will always be my biggest problem, and my, and, and, but also my greatest advantage. And so let's use it to our advantage, not let it be a problem. Um, maintainers were the, were the ones that were touching the networks the most. And what we found was, is that when we gave them a little bit of cyber hygiene and gave them a, a 20 minute video and a quizzing that that actually did improve a, a lot of those areas. So I'll, I'll wrap this up here real quick is that uh, I think technology, I think we have to understand outcomes. We have to understand requirements and match those to the outcomes, the desired effect you want. And then finally, what is the technology that's going to fill my gap? Form will always follow function. Let's not chase technology. Let technology fill the gaps of the things we need. Enemy heuristics, better integration of our of our big networks, our network operations teams, our communication squadrons, having a better integration uh, to be able to balance these. I think there's also a trade space here to be able to divide and conquer, layer these people together in a, in a better way, in a balanced way. Um, and then I think, honestly, education is the absolute cheapest thing we could ever do. We just we just don't value it in the Air Force. Um, it's cheap. Talking about hygiene, being able to, to change it up, having multiple levels of every year as you graduate from being an airman or a lieutenant to a captain or a sergeant, you get better training, you get more training, you get level 100 or 200. Uh, I think there's some great information about classified education on this stuff. Uh, I, I've been around to multiple bases teaching it. And I, when I tell a maintainer, when they go, uh, I, why do I care about you know some sort of vulnerability? And I say, well, actually... Your weapon system right there on the ramp just had a cyber vulnerability done to it two years ago. And here's the report. When I show them that, the eye, the, the light bulb goes off. It goes, oh, man, this is this is a serious thing. I don't think a lot of people know how serious it is. And then uh, lastly, I think compliance, as important as it is, um, I think they have to understand why they're complying. I think they have to understand what their mission failure risk is going to be. Uh, okay, so uh, my parting thoughts as I kind of wrap this up in the last minute or so to let you guys have some questions is, I think mission defense teams were not called cyber defense teams. And the reason why I, th I think they were called that was because I think the idea is, is, that, is that overall it's mission effectiveness and, 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 and it's mission assurance. Um, when I was down at AFSOC, uh, we had the first special operations squadron. And <clears throat> well, one of the, the gunships called AC-130, um, they had about seven different systems of, of data transfer devices and laptops and different devices that needed to be plugged into the, to the actual aircraft to get it operational and working and flying for the day. And what, they, what we found was we said, well, wait a minute, seven different areas of potential attack surface 
what 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 if we combine that into one, right? And so the air crews were all excited about it because they're like, well, heck, man, I don't want to take seven devices out there and maintenance and everything else. Take one device that has all the information, plug into the different areas, and, and I'm good to go. You you made me more efficient, and I didn't carry less stuff out there to plane. But the mission defense team got effectiveness, right? Less attack surface. And so I think there's a play there that, that we can do mission effectiveness for both sides and, and have win. At my unit, what we found was is that we had a data link on the airplane that wasn't working. And so when I fused these teams together, what somebody found was is that the laptop that goes out there was misconfigured. The contractor that, that built these laptops and issued out the software and the, and the hardware, stuff like that, and give it to these different bases, we found it was misconfigured and nobody caught it. Well, my cyber team, who's, who's pretty savvy in this stuff, they looked at it and goes, well, man, you're just, it's never going to talk to each other because, because it's not configured the right way. And can you change that? Yeah, let's talk. I'm going to call the contractor, tell them the problem. And can we fix this? Yeah, we can fix that. And they fixed it. So now my data link works. And that changed the entire uh, platform, not just my base, but changed the entire platform to have that data link. Uh, and then finally, um, there was a, a, com, uh, a um, com squadron out at uh, Air Mobility Command. Um, at, let's see here. I think it was um, the Connell Air Force Base. My buddy was out there being the squadron commander. And what they discovered was they didn't even have a weapon system that they could plug in. They just they were just in some training. And so what they did was they looked at the, the wing commander. They, they went after and they looked at all these different systems and systems across the entire base figuring out what was plugged into what, how much risk was there, getting into a vault, figuring out the, the, the risk prioritization for the boss. Hey boss, you know, this is this is a priority you said, but we found that these are a bunch of vulnerabilities. And he's like, okay, let's move that up to my number two instead of my number four. And what they discovered was, is that they knew where the key nodes were in the network that, that, that and they started really uh, looking after uh, traffic in the network, knowing where important data transfers were happening, what was from the operational unit or intel, and they kind of put together where important information flows were happening. So what happened was, is that, um, is that they actually had a a uh, a red team, an Air Force red team that was uh, practicing a uh, one of their one of their new cyber tools, and so they injected into the network uh, to test it out uh, an offensive capability. Uh, I'll just stop there and. Uh, and the, the, tw the 22nd comm squadron actually caught them doing it because they, they knew their heuristics of their network at that point. They kind of knew and they said, hey, man, like that doesn't look right. I've been looking at this network for a long time now. That's a weird thing. Let's quarantine, isolate, see what's going on there. And then they get the phone call from the red team saying, hey, guys, uh, you, you kind of quarantined one of my special tools I was using. And they're like, what were you doing using it on our network without permission? And the red team literally said, we've never been caught before. <laughs> like it was just easier to, to beg forgiveness than give permission. And, and, and so you can't make this stuff up. Uh, my last, my last thought is educate, integrate, operate. I talked about that. Um, you know, any new capability comes having to understand something. Um, you know, I think, I think slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And, and, and let's, let's start practicing this stuff. Let's get people educated what they need to be, integrate them into, into tabletop exercises, uh, you know, I found that we needed to create command post checklists for communications between leadership. And if we had problems on, on, you know, on a weapon system or how do we get notifications, I found that we we're missing that stuff and getting them integrated to, to operate. Uh, and then lastly is, is, is the caption lessons learned. Um, and so everybody can see it. Because right now, a lot of lessons are being learned in stovepipes. And we got to integrate the intel, the operations, the maintenance, the CEs, the, 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 the communicators, the, the cyber people. The information is there, I think. I just think it's not being communicated out uh, in, in the most efficient way possible. But hey, that's just me uh, making the cheap shots, right? So it's easy to complain, but those are a couple of my ideas. And I will stop there and open up for questions. All right, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. So I'll go ahead and put uh, the questions. We do have several questions that came in, and I'll go ahead and start putting them up on the screen. Um, hopefully you can. Uh, everybody can see that. Uh, the first one's more of a comment, but I just want to see if you had any amplifying comments to this, sir. It's from Joe DiGiovanni, and he says, uh, from my standpoint, the people, process, technology balance is still way off. At my base, we're seeing the pains of that at the IT service delivery layer. This may also affect the cyber defense units. I wanted to see if you had any uh, additional comments on that, sir. Yeah, I, I, I do think that even harder than the active defense piece of getting permission to plug in, 
I, I completely hear what you're saying. I, I do think that this is going to be the absolute hardest thing to do in the long run is to, you can make, you can do assessments, you can make recommendations, but then the question is who's going to take that, right? Like when you, when you really think about a cyber system at the end of the day, you can fix it through process. You can fix it through hardware. You can fix it through software. Those are my three options. And Two of those three are usually pretty darn expensive. The F-22 had a software upgrade that allowed to do from air to air to air to ground roll a couple years ago. That was tens of millions of dollars in a two and a half year upgrade to the aircraft. It is not a cheap thing to do. I think you're right. All right, thank you, sir. Moving on to the next question from Oscar Ahumada. Uh, he says, fellow reservist here, as a civilian, I work in cybersecurity operations and engineering. In uniform, I'm a 17 Sierra. My question is regarding AFCyber's challenges with tapping into the AFR's ability to provide expertise. It seems that AFRC's ability to match people to billets is at best ad hoc, even though the D even through the DT process. It's at best a function of who you know and luck. The AFRC 17X functional is woefully undermanned and frequently out of the office. How can the AFR, which I assume is Air Force Reserve, better yep. support and integrate the USAF's cyber capabilities? Man, whoo, that's the question of the day, man. You, you, you man, if you answered that one, uh, you, you should be, you should be the, uh, the commander of the Air Forces at this point for the reserves. Um, because I do, I do know those people. Um, I, I've worked with them uh, for a number of years. One of my squadron commanders, uh, I just left this base to go work in that office. Um, they're good people. They are. They are, they are undermanned. That's hundred percent. But if I'm being honest, the, the personnel system is, is 1800 Prussian military. Uh, it's, it's archaic. It's outdated. Um, that's why I got into active duty during the reserves reserves. At least I can choose kind of where I want to go. But I think we're going to, I mean, if you go down to the 960 cyber wing, man, it is there. I mean, it's, it's relatively new. I mean, we just built the 960 just in the last couple of years. It's not been around forever. Um, but, man, that, man, that is a great question. I wish I could have had a better answer to that one. Um, I, maybe. Uh, let me think about that some more. That is that is a, that is the question of the day, man. You stumped me on that one. What's the next question? I'll think about some more, man. Woo. Okay. Okay, not a problem, sir. Uh, next question comes from uh, Yuri Blumenthal, uh, Intel in risk assessment, rather limited utility, past attacks may not indicate what's coming. Uh, uh, not really a question, sir. I apologize. But um... yeah, no, it, it, it's good feedback, right? Um, I I think 85 to 90% of cyber defense is threat agnostic. I think if you have a, if you are, have a good castle with good moat and defenses, it doesn't matter if it's the House of Baratheons, the White Walkers, or or the dragons coming at you. You have a good defense, and the threat the the, the threat is, is, can be neutralized. I do think the last 10, 15 percent though is understanding what's the likelihood of the threat, and then what's the threat tactic. What's the TTP I need to be looking for to to, do, to maneuver and say, oh man, that's I've seen that tactic before. That's X, Y, and Z. So I think there is a little play there still in in the intel and the risk, but that's just you know my opinion. Okay, the next question comes from Eric Parker. Uh, have you looked into this issue in the Space Force in comparison to the Air Force? Yeah, hundred percent. So Space Force just broke off. Um, they have mission defense teams. Uh, they have some really awesome ones, and they have some really awful ones. It's this literally the same thing it's between Space Force and, and Air Force. I think the Space Force what, what they have what they have the advantage of is that Space Force, especially for prior to Air Force Space Command, they already were putting their communication squadrons inside the operations group. And that was an advantage they had. They, or the ops group already kind of ran them versus the mission support group. I think they, they, and they acted on that and had a better advantage. But yeah, we have looked at it. All right, thank you. And the next one from Yuri Blumenthal, what are the reasons to think that China does not have and utilize smaller teams of experts that silently do things similar to, to the Russians? Uh, because there's, there's, I think, Understanding your enemy, I think China has chosen 
what they want to do. Could they do this? Yes. Are they doing it? Not that I've seen. Uh, any classification level you want to talk to, I, I'm happy to have that conversation. Uh, unclassified, I, I, they just have, they've chosen not to. Uh, their view is most of their capability is looked internal into their own people and looking after them. They, they're, they're choosing uh, to control the population in a certain way and their capabilities are looking internally and that's most of their focus. And then the other side is the, the intellectual property theft. But I could be wrong. They could have those things. I just, I just, I just haven't seen the evidence of that. Uh, this one comes from your talk of, I think, the commander owning all the risk. Uh, do you consider the authorizing official a support of risk or an owner of risk? I, that's, uh, I, I think that the, I, I do believe the authorizing official, at the end of the day, my opinion, they are the number one advisor for the risk. In my opinion, they, I do not view them as the owner of the risk. All right, this one comes from Joe Giovanni. Do you believe that all the slices of your diagram have people process technology and data considerations that must be addressed in a full spectrum manner to be successful? So I think, make sure I understand this, that all the slices, active defense, defense in depth and resiliency, I'll make sure I understand this, that all those slices are what's needed to be successful. The answer is yes. I think defense in depth answers 85%. I think active defense helps out with some other percentages, but also to the other man's point or the person's point, I don't know, I don't know if you're a man or not. Um, the other person's point about the whole, like the, the intel and the threat. I think as resiliency improving people process technology, as you improve things, man, like you're improving on, on, on an area that you might not have even realized you had and you're, and you have a potential threat out there that you are now potentially real time present reducing for a future conflict. So I do think you have all three of those areas have to be successful. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, I've got a couple more questions. So, uh, why does Air Force Cyber work under ACC and not independently as their sister branches? Uh, so it's all the branches, this is all the branches are built the same way. Okay. So all of these branches contribute to Cyber Command. They, all the sister services give Cyber Command. It's just Air Combat Command is just how we want to organize, train, and equip the Air Force Cyber. But Air Force Cyber is still contributing to Cyber Command. It's still doing its own uh, CISPs, um, and, and, and uh, it's still offering other services to the Air Force. Uh, it, it does not, it, it, it's none of these services are, are independent of this. They have to have some kind of organized, train, and equip function, and that's what Air Combat Command gives, uh, and also the responsibility. So, I don't think that they're it, it's they're they're different, uh, but it, it is just the way the Air Force is is built. Right to to uh, you have major commands, you have combat commands, and the major commands are there to provide organized training and equip. But also, what's weird about Air Force Cyber is it also has a function to the combat commanders as well. So there's two pieces of that. It's kind of a unique beast, kind of like um, I guess like a COCOM. All right. All right. N normally, I, uh, um, well, I, the CISO office said that cybersecurity is everyone's job beyond our yearly information assurance requirement. Is there an AFI, DODI, or other written document that reflects this? That says that it's everyone's job? Uh, Again. I, I don't think there's a regulation that spells out responsibility lay down uh, in that way. Uh, not that I've seen. Okay. Uh, then this one from uh, Steve Klinsma. Klinsma, sorry. Uh, sounds like uh, MDTs are good in theory, but unproven in practice. Based on that presumption, how would you respond to those who argue to fix the CSSP to do the job rather than fund MDTs? 
I agree. I, I do think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. I think we just haven't implemented it the right way. Um, and, and I think with I think it has been proven in practice in small fiefdoms. Uh, but how would I respond to those who argue that to fix the CISP to do the job rather than funding the T's? Um, I, I think it's two different functions. I think the CISP at the end of the day, CISP is is that is the support network piece, right? That is that is you keeping my network alive and well for me to be able to operationalize it and use it. And, and inside that operationalization, there's still offensive and defensive functions. Uh, I think that I, I do still think there is a need to have cyber protection teams or some variant thereof to provide a little bit of the active defense. And I don't think that job should belong to the CISP, even though the 16th Air Force does have the CISP function, but it's separated from, from the, the, the offensive defensive operators. But I, I don't think that just fixing the network is ever going to make it perfect. That's why I think it, I do believe the triangle the Air Force describes. I do still believe in that, that free slice triangle. I do believe that is probably the right solution. Great, sir. All right. Uh, one more, another question from uh, Ned Swanson. Uh, he added some context to his question. Just mentioned that he's a, a professor of contract management at DAU. Uh, and he wants to know, how does the Air Force cross-train its logisticians and contracting professionals, the folks who buy your stuff, with cyber knowledge? Um, it's the cyber awareness challenge they get every year. That's it. There is no cross-training function of that. That is not a thing that, 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 that the contracting acquisitions communities, uh, they, that, that's not in their wheelhouse at all. Um, that's why I, I recommended that when we're coming up with, with the acquisition world, like when, like, I think there needs to be multiple people in those shops, including operators, including cyber operators, including um, maintenance troops. And I know that's the perfect world. People are going to tell me, yo, yo, you can't do that. But to me, acquisitions requirements are more than just the engineers. And, and if in they're working in, in, in silos of excellence or just a, here's the requirement. That's the only thing there is. But there's not a not a person who's saying, well, what about cybersecurity baked in from the beginning? If we did that, even though it might cost a little more, that would save me a long run doing all these weapon system assessments later on. So, but no, to answer your question is that that, that doesn't happen. Thank you, sir. So, uh, got one more question that I'll get to. Um, there's a couple more going in the chat, but uh, for the sake of time, we will cut it off here. This one: um, How are you going to use things like S bomb or SBOM? to help security become more responsive and get ahead of risk versus just waiting for vulnerabilities. Can I get a, what do you, when you say SBOM, what are you referring to? Good question. Uh, I, I just, I just not sure which acronym it, the, the definition is. I'm not, uh, so, so, software, software bill of material. Of material. I, I, I'm not familiar. That's, you, you got me on that one. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Um, well, sir, that that was a, a lot of questions at the end there. Um, and thank you very much for the presentation. If uh, I will capture all of the questions, if any that weren't answered, uh, myself or um, uh, Philip Payne, the the uh, CSI Act technical lead, uh, can pass them on to to Colonel Franks. But, sir, I want to uh, say thank you very much for the outstanding presentation. Uh, I have never seen so many um, thumbs up and hand clap emojis go across the screen during a presentation. So, uh, and nope, they continue to come. So, um, very, very great, sir. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, guys. I'm humbled. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.